Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for a uh, slight delay because of uh, uh, technical difficulties. Uh, so let me just uh, jump uh, straight uh, into that. Uh, today, I am going to talk to you about uh, distributed storage in the cloud. And this presentation is going to be the high level uh, overview, right? There is a lot of uh, different things to cover, so it has to be on the high level. And note that I am not an uh, expert in uh, all the technologies we're going to cover. So uh, if I am mm, wrong about something, you know, feel free to uh, use the chat to uh, correct information I'm seeing, and that will be better learning experience for uh, all of us. Now, if you think about the storage from a higher level, uh, you can see what there is a lot of storage we need to be uh, dealing with as we uh, as we build our applications. And uh, some of them we refer to as the uh, databases. I will come as a uh, as a different names, and I I will uh, will uh, really talk to uh, about all of them as uh, about the storage. And why is that? Well, because in uh, many cases you can uh, really uh, use those interchangeably. One or another approach may be. Uh, better or worse, right? So, for example, uh, a few years ago, or well, now a couple of decades ago, I would say, say we would uh, often uh, uh, make choices between storing files, let's say like a small images, inside the database or on the file system. And uh, uh, that came with you know, benefits and drawbacks. For example, if you store Small files in a database may not be super efficient, but you can do it as a part of transaction and so on and so forth, right? That is example of uh, interchangeable uh, use. Now, if you speak about the databases, databases itself are very mm, complicated. There's different data models, query languages. Databases are all uh, can be built for uh, different purposes. And there is a lot of internal design considerations which may be fit for uh, one use case. Uh, and uh, others. You can see uh, with uh, database technologies, uh, they come as uh, relational databases, right? Sometimes referred as a SQL database, and everything else uh, can be referred as NoSQL databases, but they are also can be uh, uh, presented as a number of different data models, such as document stores, key value stores, time series, graphs and uh, a lot of a lot of others now what makes it even more complicated is that there are some databases which are multimodal so that means what they can uh, really support multiple data models inside a different database and some can even talk different uh, languages and protocols to access the data uh, the same uh, uh, same data if you think about the database design standpoint, there is uh, also mm, a different choices you would uh, have. We are often separating databases which are focused on the operational slash transactional workloads versus analytical workloads, right? Often those are quite different systems, even run by different teams. We can also look at uh, different systems which are designed for uh, as a cache, versus persistently storing data for a long time to come. Some systems are based in memory. Uh, others uh, require uh, the disk storage. Some systems are designed as uh, natively distributed. There are others are really the single node systems. You know, think about something like a MySQL or, or Postgres. And uh, if you want to really distribute them, typically we'll uh, have a, a replication in place. Right? There are column and, uh, and row store database as well as a new emerging technologies uh, such as you would see their um, blockchain databases coming up for some certain, uh, certain use cases. So there is a lot of uh, complexity, if you will, when it comes to the databases. Okay, now we are talking about the storage, specifically distributed storage. Why do we talk about 
um, distributed storage in the cloud in particular? Well, one is uh, when you are building the large scale applications, uh, you will often need redundancy, performance, and scale, which requires uh, uh, distributed systems uh, to play. But even if you are uh, looking at the smaller scale systems, which could potentially be designed as a single very important server, in the cloud, you do not really uh, do that. Cloud doesn't really work well with that model, which uh, sometimes referred as uh, treating your servers as a, as a pets, right? Because you do not really have as much control in the cloud. And in a worst case, you should count on the node, which can you know disappear at any time without a trace. You have a physical server. Well, you kind of know even if it hmm, crashes, right? You often may be able to, you know, do some advanced recovery tools to recover data from the uh, hard drives, right? And some of the uh, people who've been maybe in sysadmin roles for many years have experienced putting together uh, raids, which kind of uh, systems which uh, which fall apart and doing that manually. That is not how things work in the cloud. And in certain cases, if something doesn't work out, you may just have a, an instance which is uh, uh, disappearing because you don't have any physical access to or to the server only the cloud vendor has. Uh, you can't do any of that uh, advanced recovery. But well, uh, let's now talk about um, the cloud. I think uh, if you look at the cloud and especially the storage uh, in the cloud, you can think about the uh, different uh, approaches, how you design your application. One is thinking about the cloud as a utility computing, right? And this is actually the image which uh, uh, came from Amazon itself, which was explaining the cloud uh, to people 10, 15, I don't know how many years ago, right? And the cloud was not understood in the ubiquitous. And they talk about the cloud as utility, which is something which is kind of undifferentiated and commoditized. Think about water or electricity, right? Well, you obviously need them, but uh, they are essentially the same, right? You don't really count about the uh, providers. Where it has evolved, though, is what the cloud turned into being a proprietary platform, right? Which is kind of uh, you can think about that as a similar what we had seen uh, twenty years ago with let's say Microsoft ASP.NET uh, uh, platform. Now we have AWS or uh, Google, so Microsoft, the proprietary platform which has a lot of services which you can. Uh, used together, but which, of course, comes with some you know, downside as well. What is interesting, though, is uh, same as it happened uh, with kind of uh, not on-prem development model, the open source is gradually catching up. And now we have uh, a choice of how you really use and utilize the cloud. You can think about uh, really going all in on a proprietary services, right? You lock in with uh, cloud vendors. There is going to probably a lot of tools which uh, are you know nice, well documented, integrated, lots of training and so on and so forth. But you will be essentially a, a hostage of a single vendor uh, and uh, don't have a choice. Or you can uh, uh, choose the open source stack, like for example, coming from Cloud Native uh, Foundation, which you can choose to run everywhere, use open source, and treat cloud as utility and uh, uh, and commodity. Right. So I think these are very important choices uh, uh, to, to consider. Uh, and uh, really, in my experience, with different uh, different customers. Uh, different folks, right? They make a different choice in this case. Some uh, choose really betting on the single vendor because that they believe that allows them to uh, get to market faster. Others, uh, they value independence and prefer to go with uh, open source. There are actually even free choices. 
what you can uh, embrace as a for technologies in the cloud. One is a proprietary solutions by the cloud vendors. Let's say what uh, Amazon uh, does. Then there are proprietary solutions which come from a third party, right? Let's say cloud marketplace or something. And there are the open source mm, uh, solutions. And this is framework where I am going to talk about the different uh, uh, solutions we will see. Now, one thing you will see for a lot of the clouds is uh, they are marketing their software as open source compatible, right? Say Amazon Aurora is or is compatible with Postgres or, or MySQL. But let's may not mistake, that is really uh, one way uh, compatibility, which says, hey, if you've been running on this open source systems, you will be able to move to this technology. And then there are going to be some additional advanced features, which we'll hope you will use. And then mm, guess what? You will be locked in as a, any proprietary uh, software, right? With that, I think it's very uh, important to really uh, un, uh, uh, think about uh, uh, open source, uh, especially in the cloud from the uh, uh, practical uh, point of view. And this is uh, how I approach uh, open source. Uh, what are the questions what I would uh, tend to uh, uh, to ask to classify if a software we are talking about is uh, truly open source or not. Because you know what, those days there are a lot of folks which are marketing their software as open source, where it really is open core, right, or uh, some other uh, models, uh, just because the open source is loved by, uh, by so many. So what are those important questions to ask to, to see if it's uh, open source in the practice? The first one is, uh, can you deploy your uh, solution in your environments without incurring additional costs, right? Like in software or uh, something else. Like it's clear if you are running something in the cloud, there are always costs. But if you say, hey, I just want to deploy it uh, on my laptop, well, it shouldn't cost you anything. And if solution like Amazon Aurora, well, you can't really deploy it on your laptop, uh, right? Uh, with, with some others, uh, uh, you would have a choice. The second is, do you have a broad choice of vendors if you uh, really need, need help? I think that's also important because some open source uh, may be uh, open source, but practically it's not very uh, very helpful because maybe there is only, you know, a single company which have all experience uh, uh, about it. And the third one is, can you improve the software so it solves uh, your needs, uh, your needs better? Can you contribute to the software and hire somebody uh, you need? And I think that is important, especially in larger organizations running open source and scales, which often grow into the software needs which are not solved by uh, by that particular software. You know, think about uh, Facebook, which uh, did a lot of contributions to MySQL because, well, they are running MySQL at extreme scale and uh, the product as it was built did not uh, completely match their needs. As we look at solutions, I will uh, focus on the top cloud vendors in the Western world, right? So, AWS, Azure, and uh, uh, Google Cloud. If you think about the open source solutions, I will focus on the solutions uh, which are around the Kubernetes or uh, cloud native ecosystems. Why is that? Because I think that the Kubernetes is now the leading open source operating system for private and public cloud, right? It's like um, uh, uh, Linux, a couple of uh, decades ago, but not for a single node, but actually for uh, the large amount of, uh, of servers. Now, some people ask me about why I focus on the Kubernetes rather than OpenStack. And the reality is I see a lot of people uh, deploying Kubernetes uh, successfully and much more momentum than with OpenStack, 
who is also deployed but typically only by a small number of very large organizations because it is complicated. The other upside of a Kubernetes is what it is really available as a managed solution, both from the same private cloud, public clouds I mentioned, but also from large amount of the uh, other solutions, right? Let's think about uh, Red Hat or SUSE or VMware. All of them have uh, Kubernetes support in, in their platforms. And if your company is having a strong relationship with one of those vendors, then adopting Kubernetes uh, can be easier for you. OK, let's now look at the storage uh, uh, types and the options. Now, I will split those uh, storage in kind of two big parts. One is your commodity storage, right? And this is something that has a relatively simple interface. It's uh, uh, if you need to move uh, the stuff between uh, different clouds, it doesn't require a lot of effort for migrations and doesn't create a very strong uh, locking. Often, it, uh, it really makes sense to use uh, this as a solution, as a building uh, uh, building block uh, as you roll out uh, your uh, uh, maybe your more complicated uh, uh, infrastructure. So, uh, uh, for example, no no local storage, right? That is basically your local disk, which exists in uh, uh, in majority of the clouds, and you utilize it from your application and pretty much the same way you place some local file system on it. And uh, really there is not a lot of difference on whatever cloud you are running on or, or whatever even you are running in, uh, in a non-cloud options. Uh, all uh, uh, cloud vendors in this case have uh, options. But one thing you need to note is what performance by it can differ by quite a lot, right? Different cloud vendors, different solutions for local store, uh, can uh, uh, have a performance which is different by 10x, 100x, uh, right, or more. Uh, typically, NVMe flash storage is what uh, tends to be uh, the fastest. And if in the cloud, you should think about the local storage. It is obviously not uh, reliable and not super scalable, but often it is a great uh, building block for distributed storage or something which you can use as uh, fast and cheap for local processing needs, temporary files, right, and, uh, and uh, mm, uh, whatever it is. For example, in our case, uh, if you are running uh, the clustered MySQL solution from Percona called Percona XLV cluster, we often recommend using the, the local uh, flash storage to do that because uh, it already does mm, a replication and it works very well uh, on non-redundant but very fast you know, local storage to really provide you this uh, highly available, uh, robust uh, environment. The next one is network block storage. All cloud vendors have some here. It's CBS for Amazon, uh, Azure call it my, uh, managed disks, GCP call it persistent uh, disks uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, you can see, right? And these uh, uh, often perform the same as a local storage, but they're actually network backed, so you can kill the instance, right? Or it may die on you while the data on those network block storage is uh, persistent, right? And that is considered uh, highly available solutions. Now, what is interesting uh, in this case is what uh, there are also number of proprietary vendors in this space which provide uh, specifically NetApp and the port works, which provide um, uh, additional software uh, solutions in, uh, in this regard, right? They claim to have better performance, so maybe deduplication, backup, replication, all the kind of additional stuff, which uh, classically was available for the enterprise Sun NAS uh, solutions. There is by also a bunch of open source options which exist in this case, right? Ceph, uh, Rook, Longhorn, OpenABS, uh, right? The OpenStack, 
uh, they also had this uh, block uh, storage uh, uh, project called uh, Cinder, which all uh, allows you to build the network block storage from uh, basically a bunch of local disks, right? That's something what, uh, what you can do. But again, uh, as I mentioned, in many uh, cases, we can, can consider cloud block storage, network block storage, as a utility component, which is not seriously differentiated between different clouds and just use that as a component uh, without a slow, strong lock-in. Then there is a file storage. That is basically your NFS uh, uh, file system, right? If you need uh, that kind of API, then again, all the cloud vendors, they have something which, uh, uh, which is available. Again, it's not kind of super seriously uh, differentiated. In uh, all cases, you just mount it as a local file system. There is a little bit of difference about how permissions are managed, but that is not significant. Again, NetApp and Portworx have their own uh, interfaces. Same as in the open source space, you can see some of the projects, they allow you to uh, not only talk to through a block device protocol, but also expose it as a uh, network uh, uh, file system. In my experience, uh, uh, there, uh, kind of this shared giant file system store is not as uh, uh, commonly used those days as uh, it was before. Like, for example, there we used to uh, use NFS for backups on the remote servers. Now we are moving those to object store like S3s, right? Or uh, if you say, hey, you know what, I need to have uh, 50 terabytes of images being served on web server. Well, again, that uh, would be typically served now by uh, object storage, uh, not uh, on a web server which runs uh, on some sort of NFS file system. Okay, that uh, uh, brings us to the object store. And that is very valuable, very efficient storage. Yeah? Interesting property of this is as you put the data on this uh, object storage, it becomes accessible directly by the clients through HTTP uh, or HTTPS protocol, right? That means you don't really need to maintain additional server infrastructure to server the files through HTTP, pro, uh, uh, HTTP protocol. IBS uh, has an S3. Uh, Azure has blob storage, GCP has a Google storage. They're all slightly different, uh, especially in terms of uploading the data and managing the files, but they all, in the end, can serve the data through HTTP protocol. Here, I think the situation becomes a little bit more interesting with uh, uh, vendor storage. NetApp and Fortworx, they again have uh, their uh, solutions. Uh, right, the gateways uh, to their uh, S3-like uh, interfaces, right? But what is, I think, more interesting here is there, for all the previous storage time I've mentioned, you typically want to keep your data in the same uh, data, in, this, in the same place uh, as you host your application, right? Like, uh, it wouldn't make sense uh, for you, or frankly, frankly, it wouldn't be even possible to, let's say, run your server, application server on GCP, and mount the EBS storage from Amazon to that. When it comes to object store, you have uh, additional vendors like uh, Wasabi, Blackbase, DigitalOcean, Linode, and often you can meet, meet and match neighbors, uh, vendors based on your needs. For example, some of those can be used as a rather low cost uh, backup uh, option uh, if you uh, need to store your data at a lower cost compared to what the major clouds uh, would uh, provide. If you look at the object store in an open source space, that is where Minio, I think, is an absolutely dominant uh, player in terms of being able to roll out your uh, uh, open source 
uh, object store, there are also solutions like Ceph and Use, uh, uh, Ceph and, and Rook, which you can uh, which you can use. Okay. The fact. Let us move to a more complicated database and data stores. The difference about uh, with those is what they are rather mm, highly differentiated. That means that similar uh, offerings are not easily replaceable. If you look at the, uh, let's say, PostgreSQL at Amazon and PostgreSQL on, uh, on Google GCP, right? While they're all based on Postgres, there is going to be a substantial amount of, uh, of changes to move within them. And if you specifically look at the property options, for example, looking at a Cosmos DB versus Spanner or something uh, like that, then that is going to be completely uh, different situations, right? So in this case, if you are choosing the property uh, versions, you typically have much more, uh, much more looking. Now, we'll also uh, talk uh, uh, in this space about the queues, streams, data pipelines, which are designed for moving data around often with persistence, which is not conventionally a database, but this is a very important part of modern data infrastructure. And they are also highly differentiated. So I put them in, this, uh, in the next, uh, uh, in uh, this section as well. So what do we have in this case? Well, you can see, also, for uh, this kind of solutions, there is quite a few different solutions which is available, uh, and, and especially on on AWS, they are all uh, different, have a mm, different uh, um, uh, different properties. Uh, in this case, but, but operating broadly mm -hmm. in this case. If you look at uh, uh, recent uh, space, uh, though, you can see the, the Kafka have emerged as really this uh, most common standard for moving data around between the database uh, system. And if you think about the uh, property solutions, you will find that there is uh, both the enterprise software version offering from uh, Confluent for Kafka, as well as managed Kafka by a number of vendors, uh, such as Avian and uh, uh, Instaclusters, which are uh, you know, third, uh, third party. There is also a lot of open source choices in this space. Right? You can think about like a, a Apache Kafka, Pulsar, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ. Actually, one thing which is interesting about this, uh, uh, this space is Similar to many options available in the cloud, there are also huge number of options which are available uh, in the uh, in the open source uh, open source uh, space uh, as well. Often, some solutions are specific to the particular framework or uh, or programming language as well. So that at least is by far not. Uh, uh, exhausted. Okay, now let's look at it uh, at the relational databases and specifically on the transactional. Here is what our cloud or uh, version uh, cloud vendors offer us, and you can see at uh, the high level, it's either offering the sort of uh, cloud versions or database as a service of the open source and proprietary software, right? As well as something which is um, uh, newly built on the top of that. So, uh, such as uh, uh, AWS offers uh, Aurora, right? Uh, Azure has the uh, SQL database and the hyperscale offers the GCP has uh, Spanner, which they uh, increasingly uh, promote as their sort of large-scale uh, distributed database. If you think about the proprietary uh, solutions, well, uh, you can see 
uh, both uh, our uh, you know s standard enterprise database vendors such as Oracle and Microsoft uh, as well as a number of newcomers such as Yugabyte and Cockroach DB, which offer you obviously you know commercial cloud versions of their pro, uh, products, uh, as well as uh, uh, folks like Instacluster and Avian, who manage a uh, number of uh, uh, databases uh, yeah, for you. And in open source space, well, that is where you would see your classical uh, transactional open source databases. I would highlight a couple here. One is obviously PostgreSQL, which I feel, which is in our experience getting the most traction those days. The second one I would mention is Yugabyte, which is a very interesting uh, uh, the distributed database, which is built from the ground up uh, uh, with, with PostgreSQL compatibility. And the last one is TiDB, which is built uh, by a kin, a pin cap, kind of uh, similar but different in uh, implementation details from Yugabyte architecture. Uh, also distributed database, but this one uses MySQL as a compatibility protocol, uh, not uh, uh, Yugabyte. And that is where I also can throw the Percona hat in. We provide uh, distributions for MySQL mm, and, uh, and Postgres with some uh, additional uh, uh, value, right, typically focused on the enterprise use cases, but in completely open source uh, license. Relational analytical databases, that is uh, uh, another set, and you can see it has a completely different set of solutions from uh, all the uh, cloud uh, vendors and uh, in the proprietary solutions, as well. Obviously, Oracle has uh, solutions for data analytics, but we can see also a number of uh, additional vendors here, such as Snowflake uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Vertica are often uh, seen. Uh, I also would mention Oracle Heatwave. That is something which they have been, um, came about recently, and this is sort of accelerator layer for MySQL uh, for that to be uh, able to execute analytical queries much faster. Unfortunately, Oracle Heatwave uh, only runs on Oracle Cloud and it's not mm, uh, open source. If you look at the open source, though, there is a lot of uh, uh, solutions here. And generally, these are kind of like a very big uh, uh, ecosystem, or so at least some of them. You can have a Spark and Hadoop, which has an uh, ecosystem with a lot of tools. Uh, there is a Presta and uh, Trina. These are the uh, uh, different uh, systems which, uh, which are often uh, designed to, to be able to kind of query multiple data sources through, through SQL. Uh, Mm, uh, SQL level, which can be very helpful for analytical uh, queries. And uh, uh, there are solutions like ClickHouse, MariaDB, uh, Color, uh, Column Store, and, uh, and TiDB. I think uh, their you know, ClickHouse uh, uh, deserve a very interesting mention in this case because that is like one of those databases which sort of able to talk multiple languages. Right. In addition to being able to talk through its native ClickHouse protocol, it can uh, uh, talk with uh, MySQL or PostgreSQL uh, clients, which makes it very, um, uh, very useful uh, database for many analytical uh, workloads. And TiDB is uh, interesting, and you may notice what that is present on operational database and here because it is uh, the hybrid database that can do both uh, uh, transactional queries as well as uh, analytical. Document store. Well, the document store is uh, when we do not use a relational data model, but store the documents, typically JSON, in the database, right? 
Here are the solutions which uh, all the clouds offers, and you can see we have the native uh, solutions. If you think about the uh, uh, the proprietary solutions, MongoDB, cloud and enterprise version, cloud base are the most uh, uh, common in, in this case. If you're looking at the, at the completely open source uh, solutions, well, actually MongoDB would be your source available. Uh, uh, then uh, MongoDB and, and Couchbase have community versions. Also, think about relational databases. Both PostgreSQL and MySQL actually has a pretty good JSON support those days. And in many cases, they can be used uh, uh, as a document database. MySQL even have a, like a doc store where there's a uh, MongoDB-like protocol you can uh, talk to it. Then uh, uh, the next item to cover is a key value store. Key value store, I think we operate in a two different areas. One is for caching and another is for, um, uh, for persistent store. For caching, you can see a lot of stuff uh, dominated by the uh, Redis-based uh, uh, solutions. Same in terms of proprietary, while there are a lot of key value stores, I think Redis is really dominating. And if you think about the open source, there is Redis, of course. Some applications still uh, use Memcached, which was popular before Redis came out of age. And I would also uh, mention KeyDB, which is sort of a Redis fork with some additional performance improvements. If you look at a persistent key value store, you can see where the clouds, they offer something else, like a different uh, key value store or optimized systems. Now, I call them key value stores very broad. Some of those systems, and including Redis, have a more complicated uh, data model uh, than uh, you know, playing key value store, but uh, uh, there is uh, no good um, description I could uh, come up with. In the property space, uh, we have Redis Cloud, Enterprise Redis, and really enterprise versions of all those uh, open source solutions. Pretty much uh, most of them will uh, have a community and uh, enterprise version. So uh, those days where enterprise is uh, pretty much being a proprietor. Finally, what I wanted to mention uh, is the time series databases. The time series is uh, uh, is an uh, interesting uh, phenomenon uh, where purpose-built time series databases is something which uh, is one of the fastest growing categories over the last five years uh, uh, or so. And that is for uh, very usable for storing virus, mm -hmm. sensor data, and so on and so forth. And you can think about both monitoring our complicated environments of growth in the internet of things, uh, this become uh, increasingly important. All the cloud vendors, they offer something uh, on, the, uh, on their own. Uh, and uh, you can see that there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is not a lot of uh, commercial database solutions which you see you know, on the market from this kind of legacy vendors, but there is, a lot of solutions from uh, the open source vendors, which have uh, many of them have a proprietary uh, enterprise version. Yeah, and let me mention uh, a few uh, here. Uh, one is uh, Prometheus, which is a very uh, interesting database, which uh, uh, really has been dominating as a data store in a, for metrics in the monitoring space in, in particular. Uh, it has um, Cortex and M3 uh, as a databases which were built to talk PromQL, like Prometheus protocol, but offer some of the advanced scalability options, as well as uh, Victoria metrics, which is actually quite a cool solution, which was initially built uh, around Prometheus, but it uh, uh, then was extended to talk uh, different protocols as well. Like, for example, it can, uh, uh, you know, speak in FluxDB protocol. Uh, 
InfluxDB is uh, another very popular time series database. It's not just for monitoring, but for other stuff, uh, uh, stuff uh, as well. Something else to consider. And time scale DB, uh, last but not, not least, is a PostgreSQL extension. So where other database systems here, they use their own non-relational data model and program uh, and the query language, which is actually can can be quite useful for time series needs. Time scale DB uh, is a PostgreSQL extension, which typically makes uh, PostgreSQL a lot better for storing time series data. Okay, with that, let me also explain maybe in this space in the open uh, uh, with a distributed storage in the cloud, what is um, per corner role and uh, why I'm talking to you uh, all about this. Now, if you think about what, uh, uh, what we are doing at per corner, really uh, uh, look at uh, pushing the boundaries for open source databases and really uh, for focus on the open source as I define that as a really uh, uh, as an open source for real, uh, not some sort of uh, open core software, which is marketed as an open source, but which is uh, in the end comes the same lock-in as a proprietary software. At this point, we focus on MySQL, MongoDB, and Postgres. With MongoDB, unfortunately, became source available in the last few years, but well, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of too too late for us to um, to do uh, to not to support the system as we have so many customers uh, rely on per corner uh, for uh, MongoDB those days. Uh, what we do in terms of software, we provide uh, free and open source software with um, uh, some additional uh, uh, functionality, both for Linux as well as for, uh, for Kubernetes. We have uh, very advanced operators to run MySQL, MongoDB, and Postgres in a Kubernetes and, uh, environment. And uh, we also uh, build uh, the tool called Percona Monitoring Management, again, 100% uh, open source, which can both serve as a single pane of glass for MySQL, MongoDB, and Postgres to provide you observability, some management features. And what we see is uh, really most important in the market those days is database as a service experience, right? Where instead of uh, installing a bunch of packages, you can deploy a database in a few clicks. Right, that is uh, how we are supporting the open source um, database market those days. So to sum things up, you can see what distributed uh, storage in the cloud is actually gets quite uh, uh, complicated. You can see what there is uh, no one size fits all, right? There is a lot of different solutions depending on uh, on what you, uh, what you need to be done. But I think what we can see as a great uh, is for all the areas where you're looking at the storage, uh, like as a kind of classical file-based storage, or you are looking at some complicated database and data store, there is a lot of uh, open source solutions available. With that, uh, that's all what I had. And I would be happy to answer some questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay. For the people here in the BBB, please um, yeah, um, ask a question. You can do it via chat or via microphone. You can have now the permission for it. And, and for the people who are in the in the YouTube or in a live stream, you can go downstairs at live.com.ca on the HS4 and there, please, on the video conference. And then you can come to the BBB here and ask a question. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, questions, questions. Yeah, and the questions are they coming in the public chat or something else? They can switch, yes. Everybody can switch off the micro, switch on the microphones and oh, okay. ask the question if they want. 
Sounds good. Sounds good. You gave a very good overview over the open source um, softwares. Um, do you use which software do you using for your normal business? Uh, again, use for what? For um, which um, software are you using from the open source software? Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's quite a lot, right? I mean, if you uh, look, uh, I use uh, a lot uh, in the um, uh, Linux uh space open source databases like mysql uh mongodb postgres right uh, obviously the virus tools which can be fat uh you know grafana is a project i use the uh they is uh, quite extensively yeah but i think that is kind of not uh, really very meaningful question if you say right because i'm there uh, I'm a CEO, right? So my needs in the open source software is quite different than typically the work you are in that kind of defines what open source uh, software you will be uh, using on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the audience? Do you do you coding um, do you coding um, some um, some softwares for the open source community? So do you help on some softwares there? Well, I mean, look, I uh, personally may write um, some code, but um, that is very uh, very little, uh, very little those days. I mostly work on the design of a project, right, or some testing usability of a software which uh, which we're going to provide. Okay, thank you for yeah. the answer. Interesting. And, and where do you see all those questions coming up? I don't see them in the public chat. I have like some... written it on here because I'm a chairwoman and uh, when ah, okay, okay. asking a question, I'm asking questions. Ah. <laughs> I see. So. I see. So you're just helping, uh, helping me out a bit. Okay. Well, everybody is for quite a thing. So there are yeah no other questions. So thank you very much, Peter, for your talk. And um, yeah, for the rest of the audience, have fun on the um, Frostgon. The next talk here will go on at five seven at um, 5 and 30 with it is in german with a talk um issue wir machen cloud da braucht man ja kein update um so have fun here and um yeah maybe see you again bye okay thank you bye